Welcome back to this week's episode of Unlocked. Today's episode is with Drew Hammer. Welcome. Thank you. So Thank what's you. so funny about this, guys, is <laughs> that when we like scheduled this, Drew had no idea that I was friends with her son, Army. None. None. Absolutely none. Did he, when did he call you and tell oh, you? Oh, he called me like last week and he goes, <laughs> Mom, he goes, you know, you're on with one of my dear friends, Savannah. And I go... Oh, really? I never look at my schedule. I just look that morning and tell me where yeah, I need to go. That is amazing. And he's like, oh, brother, I can only imagine what she's going to say on that. <laughs> that is awesome. I know. So your book, though, just came out. Also, I love just everything about it. Oh, everything about it. You. It like makes you feel happy, makes you feel all the good feelings. Thank you. So the color's a little off. I kind of look like Trump. But that's okay. <laughs> Hey, I can't. There's nothing I can do. Nothing about bad about that. Uh, no, nothing are you bad kidding? About I'm that. a MAGA. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so the book, where, where did the idea come from? Well, 14 years ago, I went through a very difficult divorce and mm -hmm. I was heartbroken. And, you know, God has such a sense of humor because I made a D in my first English paper in college in <laughs> English literature. So I'm the most least likely person in the world to write a book, but God had a different plan. So I started out just kind of journaling because I was just so broken and yeah. I was just pouring my heart out. And, you know, I sit on Joyce Meyer's board and she called me one day oh and God, she goes, she's like my dad's no, I know. favorite. She, oh, she's, oh. she's, and she's just like that in person. She's just no nonsense, all about ministry, sharing the gospel. And she called me one day and she said, have you totally forgiven your husband? Because I was on the board as I was going through the divorce. Mm. And I go, oh, oh, oh my gosh, of course. Yes. Yeah. And she said, well, you know what true forgiveness is. I go, oh, absolutely. She goes, it means you can never say a bad word about him again. And I was like, rut row. So as I went back into the journal, I realized not only had I not totally forgiven, but I was just kind of twisting that knife a little uh -huh. just to show the world that I was right and he was wrong. Yeah. And God really put me through a journey where I had to continue writing and continue forgiving. And then when I was writing in my journal, I realized all the miracles that happened when I was going through the divorce, I mean, like miraculous things. They're in my book and we probably wouldn't have time to go through a lot of them, but I was just astounded at the faithfulness of God. And that's where I got the title. Obviously it's a play on my name, Hammer, yeah. <laughs> but also I thought, well, every heart has been hammered. It doesn't mm. matter, you know, what socioeconomic group, whatever, every heart in this world. And if Jesus was hammered, so we will be as well. Yeah. And then I thought, well, maybe people will just come across the book and go, oh, there's a crazy woman who wrote a book at, while she was hammered. Maybe that's <laughs> funny. So I don't know. Maybe it's a marketing tool. I don't know. That's but, amazing. So how long were you married? I was married 25 years. Wow. And I had a fabulous marriage. Yeah. He just ended up having a much better time than I did. <laughs> That's what I tell people, because I can't say a bad word about him. Joyce yeah. told me, but he definitely had a better time. Yeah. And so 25 years, you mm -hmm. had your oldest son, right? Yes, Army. So Army. So Army's the oldest. I didn't yes. realize that. Yes. And then your other son lives here, right? Well, he used to. Okay. They moved back to Charleston. Okay. So, and they're total opposites. You know, Army is this artsy, out there, you know, so creative. And Victor is with Morgan Stanley and he gets his MBA and he's Mr. Businessman. Yeah. So it's really funny that two boys can come out of the same womb and be so totally opposite. Oh, without a doubt. I remember mm -hmm. talking to Army after his dad passed just about everything. And Army was just like, you know, just about all the logistics of everything. He was like, everything just happens how it's supposed to. And then I'm like, well, aren't you going to fight X, Y, and Z? He was like, I mean, th what's the point? And then it, like Victor on the other side is like, you know, no, fighting, he had trying to. to try to make it right. All right, these things. Right. So it's their total opposite. Total. But that's the beauty because mm -hmm. there's zero competition. Yeah. And they just love each other. Yeah. And so you were married for 25 years. Yes. What was it like 
coming into oh my goodness the hammer family wow because obviously people listening know it's like they've seen the headlines or they've seen just documentaries whatever it may be of kind of what people call the hammer family is like a curse oh it's just it's what i read in the papers i just am astounded Mm -hmm. by you know first of all that dr armin hammer was a communist i'm thinking (laughs) Well, he did start Occidental Petroleum. I'm thinking he's a capitalist. He's not a communist. <laughs> he believes in making money and he was very driven. But when I first met Michael, I met him on an airplane and mm-hmm. I was coming back from a mixed doubles tennis tournament and he walked on the plane and I had no idea who he is. And I literally had this feeling that I was going to marry him. It was the craziest thing. And again, had no idea. And I am this small town girl. I was raised Pentecostal (laughs) and we went to church. You know, my parents had Bible studies in their house. And I grew up in this amazing, amazing godly family. Mm -hmm. And my dad was even called into a healing ministry. So he was a banker and developed land. He was a businessman and he made a deal with God. He said, if you want me to, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I want you to bless my businesses so I never have to take up a collection. And we went all over the world praying for people and leading people to Jesus. So I always say it's going to be so much fun when I get to heaven, when all these people, generations came to know the Lord because of my dad's sacrifice and what he did for the kingdom. I know it's really cool. So I go from that, this little (laughs) safe haven bubble, bubble, and I'm like... Did I land in the twilight zone when I married in that family? And, you know, Armand was a Russian Jew. He was 5'5", five five, and here I am, 5'8", and I'd go to all these events and with heels on, I'm like six feet tall and blonde. I look like this shiksa walking into these events. And, you know, I was really intimidated at first. Yeah. But when I went to Armin's house for Christmas, I remember we spent Christmas Eve with my family and we all were like the Norman Rockwell family. We have matching flannel pajamas every year with our names <laughs> monogrammed on it, you know, very Southern. Oh yes. And I go out to the Hammers, but thank God, I didn't even, I walked into the Hammers home. I didn't even know what a Mo Digliani was. Or, yeah, I didn't know any of that. I was like Ellie Mae Clampett. Are you kidding? <laughs> I had no idea. So I walked in and thank God I didn't. And there were, you know, shelves of Fabergé eggs and all this. And I just remember thinking, these people are crazy because there were five of them. <laughs> yes. It was Armand, his wife. Armand only had one child who was Julian, who was the craziest person. I, I didn't even know people like that even existed in oh, this world. Lord. And, you know, drug addict, you know, alcoholic and rooms of pornography. And, you know, I was always taught you marry the family, not the person. Mm-hmm. And when I walked in, I thought, well, we there could be some trouble here. Mm. But anyways, then Julian had Michael and his sister, Casey, who did the lovely documentary. Oh, yes. It has not seen my children since they were five and seven. That's so, but it's insane what people will do for a yes, paycheck. Yes, yes, I and mean. notoriety maybe. Mm-hmm. So, but anyway, you forgive and you move <laughs> on, and we know it wasn't the truth. And you know, the truth always comes out, and that's what I admire about Army the most mm-hmm. is through this entire ordeal, he never spoke out. Yeah, that's he's way better than I am. Oh, I would call oof. him and go, "Well, if you won't, can I?" Yeah. You know, exactly. mama bears, it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah. Stick up for yourself. But I had a pastor once that said, if you come to your own defense, it's the only defense you're going to get. Let God mm. defend you. And that's what Army did. So because he was silent, you can imagine Vanity Fair, they all called me wanting to hear the side from the mother because yeah. these girls stayed in my home. Mm. And I say in the book that I think they saw him as Mr. Right. And he saw them in the stage of life he was in, which was not a healthy state yeah. at that time. He saw them as Ms. right now. Mm. So you put that together and it it is a bad recipe. Yeah, without a doubt, especially being in the public eye. Yes. And a lot of people weaponize that. Well, and it's also, it was the perfect storm. Mm-hmm. I know you understand this oh, because yes. it was during COVID 
and people are not at the office, they're stuck in their apartments or their houses, and the internet Mm -hmm. was a feeding frenzy at that time. Well, for sure, especially during that, during the pandemic, you had that, and that also worsened addictions. Yes traumas, all kinds of life things that no one, you just haven't dealt with. And then you're forced to sit there with it. Right. And you don't know what else to do. Right. And so that is, so with that, you met the family. You're like, all right, I'm marrying into this family. This is crazy. Well, I walk in and there's five of us and there's a tub of Russian caviar that's this big. I'd never even had caviar before. And there was a man in a tuxedo playing the grand piano. And I'm looking around going, are we having a party? Yeah. You know, is someone, is someone else coming? (laughs) Oh no, it was just the five of us. Then Armand rings his little bell and this procession of, you know, people that worked for them and tuxedos and the woman, it's like a 1940s movie with the women in the black with the organza aprons. And I was just like, wow. And they lead us into the dining room. And they're talking about the weather. Well, you know, my family, we're just all in everybody's business. Oh, yeah. We're We're Southern. Exactly. That's what you do, right? In the South, everyone's in everyone's business. And there's no way to get away from it. No, you can't. So afterwards, Dr. Hammer says to me, Drew, I'd like to meet you. I'd like for you to come visit with me in, in my library. And again, I didn't really know enough at that time to be intimidated. And I'm like, Okay, Why so not? I walk in and he's, first of all, I start laughing and he goes, what's so funny? I said, you have your library, a private library in the Dewey Decimal System. I mean, I just thought that was the funniest thing in the world because <laughs> I don't even read books yeah. very much. I mean, my kids are such voracious readers and I just read the Bible and I figure everything else is going to work out. Exactly. Give me the highlights. Yes. You know? So he sat me down and he said, you know, what are your hobbies? I said, well, you know, I like to play tennis. I grew up playing tennis. And he said, okay. He picks up the phone and he calls somebody on Christmas day and says, I need a country club membership for my new granddaughter. And, you know, I'd like to have it in two weeks. And he hung up and I was like, is that a bat phone? I mean, how does this stuff happen? <laughs> yeah. I was like, who is this man? You know, because we didn't have Google back mm-hmm. then. And I, you know, we couldn't look things no. up like they can now. I mean, you know, unlike other people, oh, I didn't know who he was. We won't talk about who that is. Yeah. But, you know, I really didn't at that time. I kind of had glimpses of it. So I just thought, oh my gosh, what am I marrying into? And next thing I know, I'm flying on his private 727 with... Gorbachev on the plane and people you read about in the papers. But I have to tell you one instance that really changed my life forever, Savannah, is I was, I grew to be intimidated because Mm -hmm. the more I learned, I thought, what in the world am I doing here? And we had gone to a black tie event and I didn't know how to dress. You know, I was two-stepping cowboy boots in college. (laughs) And, you know, these women were dripping in jewels you read about them in the papers. They're, you know, world renowned. They're and the elite. Yes. And I'm sitting there and I started thinking, God, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? You know, I'm not a blue blood. I'm not from, you know, the wealthy. I'm not a Rockefeller. Yeah, I went to Oklahoma State University. <laughs> I didn't go to, you know, Ivy League schools. I'm not that smart. I'm scrappy. Mm -hmm. But I thought, what in the world am I going to talk to these people about? And right next to me was this elderly man in his 90s in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And he introduced himself and he said, I'm James. And I said, oh, I'm Drew Hammer. He goes, oh my gosh, Armin's one of my best friends in the world. And he's told me all about you and he loves you. I said, well, that's because I don't know enough to be intimidated (laughs) by him. So I treat him like I treat everybody else. Yeah. And He said, how in the world did you meet Armin's grandson coming from Tulsa, Oklahoma? He told me you're from Tulsa. And I said, God. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, my parents prayed to Jesus their whole life for the right godly mates. They said, besides deciding to live your life for Jesus, your mate is the next most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Mm -hmm. And my parents prayed for the right godly mates for their children. And I said, I met him on an airplane and it was instant attraction. 
We went to lunch the next day. I started sharing Christ with them because that's just who I am. If you get to know me more than five minutes, you're going to hear it. (laughs) Much to my son's chagrin, probably sometimes. And he started crying. Tears started coming down his eyes. Mm. And I said, did I offend you? He said, no, may I tell you a story? I said, of course. He said, I'm James Roosevelt, and I'm the oldest son of President Roosevelt, and I campaigned with my father. And back then you campaigned by train. And he said, we would go from train station to train station to each town. And my dad would say, James, we need to pray that if God wants me to be president, he will give me favor with the people. Mm. And everywhere we stopped. And he said, when my dad was elected, he said, he took me to the Oval Office. And he said, now, James, we need to thank God. And he said, Drew, I have not thought of that story in 50 years. And I said, well, James, it's time to give your life back to Jesus. So I prayed with him right there at the dinner table. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, Drew, he didn't care if you're a blue blood, if you went to an Ivy League, you know, if you're a Rockefeller, whatever. You just lead people to Jesus. That's why I put you there. So my book basically is about the tremendous experiences as God has given me. And I was able to share Christ with Princess Di. We were together several times and, you know, world renowned people that God would put me right next to them. And I thought, well, if they don't have the Lord, I have something they don't have. Excuse me. And I even had the privilege of leading Dr. Hammer a 91-year-old Russian Jew to Jesus four months before he died. Oh. Yeah, that's why God put me there. Wow. That is in, I cannot imagine just the stories and the life and the, the, so when you, where was that question going with that? Dang it. I'm like so amused by all of this. There's a gazillion questions. Yeah, I know. It's like, that is absolutely insane. So Princess Diana, that is, that's where I was going with it. Yes. What was, how in the world does one get in a room with Princess Diana? Well, we were riding on Armin's coattails because he was very good friends with Lord Mountbatten. And when Lord Mountbatten died, he said, will you take Prince Charles? Well, Charles, he called him, of course, under your wing, And so they started the United World Colleges. Mm -hmm. And because of that, there were a lot of fundraisers. So we would fly all over the world with Armand and go to these fundraisers. And they would kind of introduce us and bring us. They would always have these VIP receptions and then the VV IPs, whatever that means. Of course, my (laughs) saying is, is if you have to pay to be a VIP, you're not a VIP. So there you go. Yeah. But we would get into the very small receptions and they always kind of put us together because we were in rooms of all 80 year olds. Because when, you know, dinner is a hundred thousand a person, a fundraiser, you're not going to get 30 year olds. No, you're just not. And we had sons at the same time and she was, you know, always thrown in these enormous crowds. Mm -hmm. So the third time that we were together, she walked right up to me because Francis, Armin's wife had just died. So Armin sent us in his place and she came up to me and she said, Drew. And I thought, okay, that's really weird. When Princess Di not only knows your name, but remembers it. I mean, I was like, wow, God. And to your first name. Yes. That's a different, like yes. a lot of times you'll just remember people's last names or right. who they're with. And you're like, oh, but. Right. So she came up to me and she said, Drew, she said, I'm so sorry to hear about Frances, how she passed mm-hmm. away. She said, I loved her. She was such a wonderful woman. I said, me too. She was really made me feel welcome in the family. And she goes, she leaned in and she goes, did you get the jewels? <laughs> and I go, <laughs> are you kidding me? You have a vault of royal jewels yeah. and you're talk, asking about this. And she said, oh, nobody had jewels like Francis. I said, yes, wow. I did. But they were so enormous, you know, 184 carats of emeralds or whatever. Oh. And you can't wear them. No. You get your head knocked off, Literally. especially in Los Angeles. So I donated them to, chair, to our foundation and we sold them and helped people. Oh. But I said, yes, but I said, Princess Di said, let me tell you something. I go, guess what she took with her? And she said, what? I said, 
her relationship with Christ. That's all she mm. took with her. I said, she, nobody goes to heaven with a U-Haul. Mm. And I said, those jewels are still here and you're not taking anything with you, even being the most wo- world renowned princess in the world. I said, the only thing you're gonna take with you is your relationship with Jesus and he wants to have a relationship with you. And you know, we talked for a few more minutes and God just literally parted the Red Sea. I could tell she just stopped and God gave us this moment where I could really minister to her. And when, at what time was that in correlation of her death? Okay, Just out of that, curiosity. well, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly. I'd have to really think about the dates, but probably I would say 15 years before, maybe okay. 10 years before. No, okay. maybe 10 years before. But I'll tell you, there's another part to that story. This week's episode of Unlocked is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year. So you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June of 2022 and May of 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then you know I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I absolutely love it. And now it's October and October is the season for wearing masks and costumes. But some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more than we want to at work and social settings around our family, friends, you name it. A lot of us are hiding how we truly feel. Therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take off the mask because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for our emotions. Y'all, I'm so guilty of this. So, so guilty of this. I can put a smile on my face all while feel like I'm drowning inside. And that's why I turned to therapy years ago because I knew I needed some help understanding how I feel, why I feel, all the different things. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can can switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. So take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash Savannah today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash Savannah, S-A-V-A-N-N-A-H. So when it came out that there were infidelities in his marriage with Camilla Um, And it was about seven years into their marriage and she had an eating disorder that the exact same thing happened to me. Seven years into our marriage, I found out that um, my former husband was in an affair and I was an exercise anorexic, but we didn't really know what it was back then. Yeah. You know, and that was the only thing I could control. So I would go out and run 10 miles a day and that was just my stress reliever. Mm -hmm. And the Lord told me one night, write her a letter. And I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. She is not going to get a letter from me, you know. And for five nights, I couldn't sleep. And when I tell you I couldn't sleep, I was up all night. And God kept speaking to me, write her a letter. Because we were going through similar things. So finally, after the fifth day, I'm a little dense. I said, okay. So I got up in the middle of the night and Savannah, I have to tell you, I really don't remember 90% of it because the Holy Spirit just wrote that letter for me. Mm. But I explained to her, I would never be presumptuous enough to say, I understand what you're going through Yeah, because mine isn't all over the world in the papers, but I do understand a small part of it. And I know the heartbreak behind it. And I also tried to control it, 
you know, with my weight and, you yeah. know, exercise and the whole thing. And the Lord just had me totally minister to her and say, you know, this is when God does his greatest work, but we have to relinquish power because we can't control this. You know, there's so many things in this world yeah. and you know that we cannot control. And it seems like the more you try to control it, the more south it goes. Absolutely. So I said, you know, I shared Christ with you before and I laid out the plan of salvation that it's so simple that people miss it. That all God wants, he created us to have a relationship with him. We are created as mental, spiritual, and physical beings. And most people develop the mental and the spirit uh, and mm -hmm. the physical, but they leave out the spiritual. And I said, Princess Di, this will take you down, but God is there and he wants to hold you up. And mm -hmm. I know I said so much more, but I honestly don't remember. Yeah. And it was so interesting because again, I would never say I was the only one, but because there was a familiarity, God opened the doors for me to do that. And you were part of a very prominent family. Yes. That she probably felt safe and yes. comfortable. Yes. So I just basically said, this is the time to give it to the Lord. And it was so interesting. Well, first of all, I had to call Armin's assistant or his executive assistant and ask for her address. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> and she's probably like, and why are you writing her letter? Yeah. And then when you go to the post office, you have to get the postage for overseas. And I'm like, Stop. oh my gosh, I look like a child sending <laughs> a letter off to Santa Claus. This is so embarrassing, God. <laughs> but I thought, okay, but I got to do it. I know I'm supposed to do this. So I mailed it off and slept like a baby. I mean, it was That's so amazing. interesting. Mm -hmm. So when she was in that car wreck, she didn't die immediately. And I kept praying, God, I know you're speaking to her because you would not let me sleep. And again, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to think that I was the only yeah. one, but I know I was one vehicle. And by the way, God loves, you know, the person who cleans your toilets as yeah. much as he loves Princess Di. He loves everybody, mm -hmm. but that's just the, the people that God placed me in. Yeah. And so you said seven years into your marriage was when yes. you found out about the infidelity. Mm -hmm. How did you repair that to continue to stay for 25? Well, I loved <laughs> him. I loved him. And I wanted my sons to have a father. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just do what you're supposed to do. And God doesn't say forgive one time. He says forgive seven times times, what is it? Seven times 70, yeah. I think it is. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I had to put my faith, my words into my walk. And I loved him. And there was repentance at that time. Mm -hmm. But 25 years later, or actually 19, because we were married 25 total, um, I found out that infidelities had gone on a lot more. And, you know, people say, well, didn't you have signs? And I said, are you kidding? We were best friends. Yeah. We went out every night. We always used to say we are the best empty nesters <laughs> in the world. Love our kids. But this is a party. We had a ball. And I found out that he went to the Bel Air Hotel at lunchtime. And I used to brag to all my friends and say, I have the happiest husband in the world. He comes home every day happy. And then I found out he was going to the Bel Air Hotel at lunch. And I thought, well, heck, I'd have been happy too. I mean, yeah. can you imagine? No wonder he was so happy coming home every day. <laughs> no, that's not true. You're never happy when you're living that lifestyle. But here's what I will say, Savannah. I wished, I wish that I knew then what I know now. Because he was abused as a child and he went through sexual abuse and physical abuse. And our generation kind of swept it under the so carpet. You didn't get help. You didn't have therapy. And in the South, you, you just go to church. Yeah. You just pray. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, that is the best solution. It is. But a lot of times religion at, is used as a way to justify yes. poor behavior yes. or things that have happened. So that's why I feel like Christianity as a whole, especially right now, there is, I re I know why so many people have a bad taste in their mouth about it. Right. Because people use religion as a tool to say, well, you know, that was part of God's plan. This was, well, it's, it's hard to understand that when you're someone that's been abused and you're like, oh, so this, this is what God wanted for me. Right. You know? And so I think, especially too, during that time, religion was just used as like, 
well, it's, it's God's plan. It's this, it's well, that. You just go to church and you yeah. pray about it. And you do. That's the first yeah. thing we should do. But also a lot of times there are these deep stemmed issues mm-hmm. that need to be brought out. And, you know, I, I didn't know what a therapist was or a psychologist psychiatrist or we didn't do that in the South. You just went to church. And actually that's one of my biggest regrets as a mother Mm. is the situation that happened to army when he was young and it happened in church. But I hope that I have a platform to helping other parents because I didn't understand that children will sometimes lie that nothing happened because they take the blame and they're ashamed. The shame. So Army kept telling us nothing happened. You know, I just am the one that exposed it. It happened to several other young boys at the time. But because nothing happened, we took him to a therapist like three or four times, a Christian therapist. And he's like, Mom, I don't need to go anymore. Nothing happened. And I forgave. And I took him at his word, which I shouldn't have done because he was ashamed. Mm -hmm. So I was not proactive in helping him. And years later, he told me, but Mom, you should know that that screws a child up even if nothing happened because he's in a position of authority in a church and it's not right. And I said, you're right. You're so right. So I really pray that through this book, I can have a platform in a lot of different areas Mm -hmm. because if you don't forgive, that will eat you alive. I meet so many women and men who are divorced. Does, do their spouses deserve to be forgiven? No, but neither do I. Yeah. And the importance of forgiving and letting that bitterness go because I meet a lot of people that are extremely bitter and it doesn't hurt the other person. No, it hurts He's you. off having a ball, pardon the pun. And mm-hmm. here, you know, these women are, you know, completely eaten up with bitterness. And also you have to be proactive with your children. And I wasn't yeah. because I think the way I was raised, you just go to church. So I just thought we'll just immerse in the church and get prayer and all this. But again, sometimes there are deep stemmed problems that you have to bring out and you have to deal with. Yeah. Because if you don't, like you said, it, especially to, as a parent, like I've heard my parents, I've heard other parents talk about it. Like you think you're doing everything in your power to protect your children. You think you've done it all and you've made all the right decisions. And then to come to find out that I really didn't. Right. And it's hard for parents to take responsibility and accountability for, for that. Right. And I think that's what a lot of children struggle with is like, well, is this my fault? Is this their fault? Is this, you know, and when something like that happens at such a young age, especially for a man, you know, like, and to not to say, to please let me correct myself, not to say that it's not bad for women. It's equally as bad. Right. But I have spoken to a lot of men who have gone through things like that. And they're like, well, does this mean you're gay. Does this mean you're, you know, there's all these different emotions that the devil comes to kill, steal and destroy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then you try to mask it with alcohol, drugs, poor decisions. And it's not to make an excuse for poor behavior, but if we spent more time understanding why people did behind the things that they did or why they ended up where they ended up, we would have a lot more empathy for people. Well, and you and I have been through major trials and I, we don't believe that God put those trials on us, but mm-hmm. what we do believe is that God takes those trials and then can use us to help others. And that's what you're doing mm-hmm. on your podcast. I'm so proud of you. Thank I really you. am. Thank you. I, you know what? It's tough, but I will say I, you know, there's so many times that I've spoken about God and how like, it's okay. I say all the time, it's okay to be mad at God. Like right. it's okay to be mad at God. But there's a difference between being mad and then questioning right. God and his existence. Two totally different things. Well, and I always say you can question, like when I was going through my divorce and I was so wounded, I would say, God, you know, I was a good mother. I was a good wife. How could this be happening to me? Yeah. You can question things like that. Yes. but. Don't ever question his sovereignty Mm -hmm. because he's still there. And the bottom line is people will fail us. Yeah. But God will never fail us. So, you know, if we question God, it's really because 
people hurt us, not yep. God. And he's there to pick us up. It was funny because when Army filmed that movie, um, Man from Uncle, okay. he, you know, he's always like, Mom, if you come on the set, don't start going around talking about Jesus to everybody. And I go, <laughs> moi, why? I would never do that. What are you talking? <laughs> and he's like, Mom, I'm serious. So Guy Ritchie directed it and it starts sprinkling one night and he says, Guy comes out and he says, Drew, don't stand out in the drizzling rain. It's cold. Come in my trailer and you can see what I look for in the cameras. And I go, well, that's fun. I didn't get two steps in. And he's like, so I heard you're one of those born again Christians. And he goes, well, I actually think that's a crock and a crutch. Mm. And I was like, oh, hold me back, Lord. And I thought, nope, he brought it up. I'm going for yeah. it. So I said, well, a crock. I said, you've been through a horrible divorce, right? And he goes, yes. And I go, and I'm assuming that both of us went through divorces with people who were more powerful than we are. And he mm. goes, yes. And I go, it can take you down, can't it? And he goes, yes. And I said, well, a crock. I said, I completely relied on Jesus and he got me through. And I said, in the crutch part, I said, when I needed more than a crutch, he carried me. And he mm. said, damn, that's a good answer. But then of course, Army walks in when I'm talking to him about it. And I'm like, okay, guy, tell Army, you brought you this brought up. up. I didn't do this. So <laughs> so with, with Michael, did you ever get your, before he died, did you guys ever have a final like oh. conversation? Oh or my gosh, a, a million. I'm sorry. Oh, Just, he would call me sobbing. You know, I've made the biggest mistake of my life because we had this beautiful family and I was yeah. loyal and I, we loved each other. We never fought. That was the craziest thing. Yeah. Um, but now I know because of his past, he was filling a self-esteem problem yeah. with acquiring women, basically. But he would call me a million times. I'm so sorry. I made the biggest mistake of my life. And I'm like, yep. You, did. you sure did. Yeah. But I'm also not going to be that woman that turns her head for a lifestyle. Yeah. And I sat my boys down and I said, you know why I'm divorcing your father, right? And they said, yeah, infidelities. And I said, yes, but it's a little further than that. I said, if I stayed with your father and looked the other way, I'm teaching my sons it's okay. And it's not okay. Mm. I have to be an example for my sons. And... But we became actually very good friends. He used to call me even with the wife that he married going, I've made a mistake. She's not you. And I'm like, yep, but I'm not your therapist. Call somebody yeah, else because I'm not going to be the other woman. Yeah. But we became extremely good friends. We would spend holidays together with our grandchildren because, again, life is about forgiveness. What are you yeah. going to be better the rest of your life? And I wanted to enjoy my grandchildren with their grandfather. Yeah. And when he died, I remember I'd go down and see him all the time and I would literally crawl in his bed and I'd put mm -hmm. my arms around him. I would pray over him and I would exonerate him and say, I love you. You're the love of my life. And I love you for the father that you were to my children. You did your very best as broken yeah. as your heart was from your childhood. And I said, you know, I love you. And I would pray for him. And, you know, we just had a beautiful one time I was praying for him and I played worship music when he was in his bed. And mm. he said, I see angels. It was really beautiful. Wow. So I know, I know that I know that God restores all and he's in heaven. And, you know, we're all going to be rejoicing together someday. I love that. I remember when he was passing and mm -hmm. army, like I would send messages and yes. Thank you for he, being such a good friend. He showed him. up even when all that stuff was going down with army and his ex-wife and all that, like Michael was still paying for the grandkids to stay in Cayman. Yeah. You know, like, and that goes to show he he's loves, like, yes. he didn't agree with her or things, but he loved them so much that he was like, I want to see him as much as possible. Right. Cause it's not about what yeah. happens. And you know, when they got a divorce, I actually, you know, wrote 
Army's former wife. And I said, let's let bygones be bygones. And we have these two amazing, incredible children Mm -hmm. that you brought into this world. And I'll always love you for that. Yeah. I didn't get the response I wanted, but that's okay. (laughs) Hey, you can't control other people's responses. Absolutely. But you can control what you put out there. Exactly. And that's what I've realized is like it, people can say what they say, but like, I know I did the right thing. Right. Or I know that I tried. I know, and now how they receive it is how they receive it. Right. But I know I tried. Right. That is, wow, that's amazing. Because just looking back, like when he passed, just hearing those stories, yeah. I'm like, that there was a lot of things that when you look back and you're like, okay, well, and you like try to make it make sense. And you're like, well, Army got to go to Santa Barbara. He got to maybe make some things right. He well, got, he got to, sober. Yeah. He's been sober for four years. I mean, I'm seeing miracles. And sometimes, you know, he was just on Piers Morgan saying, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. I wouldn't go back because I'm sober. I'm healthy. I'm, you know, in a great place. I get to be there for my chi- for my children. And, you know, God restores all. And yeah. sometimes we have to lose everything to realize that. And do you think ever at times you're, because you are very faith filled and religious. And do you ever think that religion drew a wedge between you and your kids at times? Oh gosh. Well, and I will say, I actually don't like religion. I think wars Mm. are fought in the name of religion. Mm. I believe in a relationship. And my dad said something when I was five years old that never left me. He said, Drew, the longest distance in the world is 12 inches. It's moving God from here to hear. It's not about religion. Religion is man's way. He created us to have a relationship with him. Mm. And that's why I brought Army and Victor into this world, because I love them and I want a relationship with them. And yes, it did put a wedge in our relationship. Not with Victor. He's always, you know, been there. He's the Morgan Stanley. You yeah, know. he's the <laughs> straight arrow, always did what's right. I only remember disciplining him as a child. He was like this perfect child. And that other one. No, but he's so much fun. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, Army didn't want to be around me because yeah. I talked about God and I was praying for him. And when you're not living your life right before God, I always say he wasn't criminally wrong. He was morally wrong. Mm-hmm. He was exonerated on everything. And I kept calling him going, well, I keep reading that you're a cannibal. Are there any limbs missing out there? I don't know. What am I missing out on? And you don't think as a mother, you're going to read that your son is a cannibal. Yeah. And I'm like, well, Army, I look at babies and go, oh, you're so precious. I could eat you up, but I'm not eating. Yeah. (laughs) There were a couple stupid Dexes. I think that's where that came from. And you know, you're drunk and you know, whatever. You never think it's going to be put out in the press, which you Mm -hmm. write. But anyways, did it cause a wedge in our relationship? Absolutely. And my friends kept telling me, stop talking about God around him. He doesn't want to hear it. And I go, well, I'm not going to be a popular mom. I'm not going to call him and say, son, I'm throwing it out to the universe. Mm. I'm thinking positive thoughts. What's that going to do? Yeah. I'm going to pray directly to God and say, help you help me with my son, period. I'm not going to mm. be the popular mom. So he had periods of time where he wouldn't call me back. So he was at the house one day and I go, hey, Army, can I see your phone for just a second? So I got his phone out and I went to my contact that said mama on it. And I changed it to Paramount Studios. <laughs> and I waited a couple of days. I, I, I was a little cool about it. And then I called him and he's like, hello. And I go, you are so busted. <laughs> Because I thought, well, he's going to answer if it's his Paramount Studios, right? I go, you are busted and you better answer my calls from now on. That is amazing. Oh, yeah. So I'm a tough mom. He'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, she terrifies me. Oh, yeah. No, I do. I remember during what led me to ask that was because I remember during that time and I would always encourage him, like, just have a conversation. Say how you feel. Just I believe in arranged marriages. I'm just going to add that. (laughs) I'm like, just, just say how you feel. Just, and eventually he got there, but I was like, during times I'd like see stuff and I'd be like, just stop, just stay offline. Just do stop this, stop whatever you're doing, just stop. 
Um, Where have you been all my life? Oh my <laughs> gosh. Um, that is hilarious. So you're, what would you say for parents that are, find themselves in that situation of it feeling like it's almost impossible to reach their child? Never stop praying. And I do believe that some people have to, you know, I believe God will tell you how to handle it. But Mm -hmm. here's the thing. And I said this to Army one time. I said, Army, my dad, your grandfather was the most godly man alive. But if I was in my 50s and doing something that was not right, according to the word of God, he would call me on it. Mm. Right. And I would almost be disappointed if he didn't call me out on it because I know what he stands for. Yeah. And he raised me that way. So he'd be on Jimmy Kimmel and he'd go, oh, man, my mom is going to hate this story. And I'd call him (laughs) up immediately afterwards. You're right. I hate that story. And I didn't raise you like that. And why are you getting on there taking the Lord's name in vain? I mean, I'm just not going to be cool. Yeah. I'm not a cool mom. Yeah. I'm just not. But other parents have prayed about it and they felt like the Lord told them to sit back and just pray and be quiet and let them come back to you like the prodigal son someday. Mm. Well, I'm just guaranteed the Lord didn't say that to me. So I just (laughs) wasn't going to, I wasn't going to humor him because he was wrong in the way he was living his life. And I'm going to call him on it. I raised him that way. He knows what I stand for. Yeah. I love that. That is because it's such a challenge. I think it's it's such a challenge to reach people, just especially in today's day and age. And it's like, well, how do I do it? How do I reach people? How do I show the love of God without forcing my beliefs on someone else? Well, I probably forced it way too much. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. You know, it's just my personality. If it doesn't fit, force it. it, you know? I love it. Yeah. My dad always said, he was like, I'm here to be your parent, not your friend. Right. So like, would I love to be your friend at some point in life? Yes. Right. But I'm here right now. I'm here to be your parent. And not now your you're friend. the parent. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, oof, it's a tough. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. So what do you hope comes from your book? Um, I hope that more people come to know Jesus Mm. because again, we've all been hammered. This is a tough life. And a perfect example is I met a woman who was going through divorce. Her name's Laura and she was skin and bones, had a, like a three-year-old and a one-year-old and found out that her husband was not only not going to Thunderbird that she was paying for, but that he was going off with women Mm. And I came up to her at a dinner party and I said, what's going on in your life? I could feel it. I could see it on her, just devastation. And she told me what happened. And I said, do you believe in Jesus? And she said, no, I actually grew up Unitarian. I said, Mm. okay, well, I'm going to give you two choices here. I said, you can go through this without God and it will take you down. Or you can go through this with God And it will still be one of the most difficult things because Jesus never promised us a perfect life. It'll be one of the most difficult things that you've ever gone through in your entire life, but you're going to make it. Yeah. And she goes, well, that's an easy choice. I said, okay, we're going to lunch tomorrow. I'm going to bring you a Bible and some books and we're going to get started. And she is the most on fire. This is 30 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, the most on on fire, gets up at 5 a.m. and watches hours of Christian television before she starts her day teachings. And it's changed her life. And it would have taken her down otherwise Mm. because she was married to a total narcissist. Oh, yeah. I. So that's what I hope. Yeah. Is because when you can be really self-deprecating and tell the truth. Because to me, if you're going to write a book, don't write a flowery, cheesy no. Hallmark. Don't don't think I don't love Hallmark stuff. But if you're going to do it, give the good, the bad, and the ugly. Exactly. Because you've that's be what honest. this world is. You have to be honest about the role that you've played in your own story. Yes. And a lot of people have a really tough time doing that. Yes. But you have to be, if you're going to write a book, be real. Mm -hmm. And that's why it took me 10 years. You know, don't want to rush into anything, but because I knew that I had to deal with all of this, like the situation with army. He's my son. 
it's the white elephant in the room. Yeah. I can't not deal with it. But mm-hmm. of course, I sent both my sons the chapter and I said, you know, you have to approve of this because you're my son first mm-hmm. before I write about this. And if there's anything you don't want in there, an army wrote back immediately and he said, I think it's perfect. I'm proud of you. And it's the truth without you know, trying to hurt somebody else. And I said, that's not what this is about. Yeah. This is about when he, when we hit rock bottom, we have a savior. Yeah. And it's not about just going to heaven. It's about living heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. And even when we hit horrible situations, God is going to restore all. He promises us that. Without a doubt. You have to live life. You can't let life live you. Yes. That's great. I'm Without a doubt. That. That's okay. good. Come on. Come on. Yeah. All right. So where can people find you? Where can they find your book? Well, I have a website and it's called Drewville.com. D-R-U-V-I-L-L-E. Okay. Because my sons used to tell their friends that they grew up in Whoville because I decorate <laughs> with hot pink and lime greens and lemon yellows. And so I thought, well, then I'm going to call it Drewville. And it's it's my brand. I have a bunch of different fun things on there that I believe are inspired by God. And you can buy my book on drewville.com and other products, or you can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. And I did an AI project called gethope.ai. And I answered over a thousand questions of what the Bible says. Wow. And it's like a holograph and you push a button and you can ask a question and the AI spins it to answer that question, what does the Bible say about this? And I researched what atheists think, what they would question, agnostics, different religions. And then from there, I did a 365 journey where I walk through the Bible in 15 minutes a day. Oh, and wow. you can literally walk through the Bible because I think that's one of the problems today. Because oh, even, even if you believe in Jesus, yeah. if you don't know the Bible, that's our daily manual of how Without he wants doubt. us to live our lives. And if you don't read it and you don't know the Bible, what's to keep us from mm-hmm. not doing the right thing? I love so that. So you can get all that on gethope.ai. Okay, gethope.ai, so. drewville.com, mm-hmm. your Instagram, Drew Hammer. Yes. And drewville.com, my okay. Instagram. Perfect. So, well, thank you so much thank you for, for having no, me. Thank you. I already love you. <laughs> I do. You're, you're a doll. Thank, thank God. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God.